Yeah. So come up front. I'm not using a mic. Okay. So here's where we were. What was the last thing we covered? Shankar. Backup diagrams. We did Markov decision processes, and we spoke of backup diagrams, right? And we spoke of two different kinds of equations. One was the Bellman expectation equation. There was the other. The, what was the other? The other Bellman equation that we spoke of. The Bellman optimality equation. And what was the difference between the two? What was the difference between the two? One is for the? No, no, no. So what, what was the difference between the expectation equation and the optimality equation? Uh, I think expectation equation is based on our policy. Uh-huh. But on the other hand, the optimality is just our policy. So the expectation equation is the, it tells you how to compute the values for any given policy. The optimality equation tells you how to compute values for the optimal policy, right? And the expectation equation was something, given a policy, it was something that we could actually solve for using a simple linear algebraic equation. But the optimality equation could, could not just, it was not algebraic, it was not a nice little linear a uh, set of linear equations because within the equation itself there was a max. So you could not actually solve it just using an algebraic operator, right? And uh, how many of you encountered that question in the quiz? And you got it right. Okay, <laughs> so now, so let's continue with the business of Markov decision processes. If I give you a Markov decision process, meaning what are all the variables in the MDP? It's the states, it's the transition probabilities, but transition probabilities as a function of the action. And uh, the set of actions, the set of rewards associated with each action at each state, and a discount factor. And uh, we know why we needed the discount factor. We saw this several times in the last couple of class classes and also during the quiz. So given all of these, we want to find the optimal policy. So think of it this way. I give you a very small game. It's like a chess game, but it has a finite number of states, maybe only a thousand states. Or tic-tac-toe. Tic-tac-toe, you actually know the state space completely, right? It's really small. Uh, how many states would you have in a tic-tac-toe game? There are nine, nine squares, right? And each of those squares can have one of how many symbols? Two? Three. It could be blank, right? So three raised to nine. That's the maximum number of states you can actually have in a uh, tic-tac-toe game. But that's a really small number compared to all the various possibilities, right? So given, let's say, let's say I've given you a Markov decision process where everything is defined and you want to find out what is the best thing to do in each state at each time, right? So what is the best action? That is the problem of finding the optimal policy. You can find out the values for the uh, states at using any odd policy, but what you're really interested in is winning the game. So what is the optimal policy? So this business of finding the optimal policy given the complete Markov decision process is what we'll call planning. So anytime you hear this business, this term planning, this is really what we're speaking of. Now, there are two ways of dealing with it. You can either uh, have a value-based solution. What I mean by a value-based solution is you can find the value of every state under the optimal policy. And then based on those values, I can go back and find the policy. And it turns out you can do this without, you can find the values without knowing the policy. So you can find the values first and then compute the policy. Or you can compute the policy directly, in which case you really don't know what the values are, you just find the policy directly, right? So uh, let's look at what, how we would do this value-based planning. 
In the value-based planning, this is the value-based solution, again, there are going to be two steps. The first step is what we will call prediction, where if I give you any policy, you must find the value of every state under that policy. This is the problem of prediction. I give you everything and I give you the policy, what is the value of each state? And then the second one is control. If I know how to find the value for every state, how do I find the optimal policy, oh, yeah, right? So control is finding the policy, best policy prediction is finding the value of every state given any policy. So let's just take a look at this problem of prediction because it turns out this is the key to the whole problem. You have to be able to assign values in order to decide what the best policy is. Although you may not explicitly do so, it's always going to be implicit somewhere, right? So here's the question. First, how do we represent the value function for any state? Now, it depends on a bunch, bunch of factors, right? If you have a tic-tac-toe game, then the number of states is really very small. It's three raised to nine, which is nine raised to nine cubed, 81 times nine, 729, right? It's a really small, uh, uh, really, three raised to nine? Uh, 729 times 27, something like that. But still, it's a really small number. Uh, the, uh, uh, now, so the number of states, you can actually enumerate them. And for every state, at every state, I can have a finite number of actions. Let's say the number of actions is four in any state or maximum. Uh, in any given state, you can mark one of the nine cubes. So there are nine possible uh, actions, right? So that, that gives us three raised to 10 possible state action combinations, three raised to nine possible states. Each of them is, has nine possible actions. So the table is really small. Although that number seems large-ish, the table is really small. So what I could do over here is just write state one, state two, state three, action one, action two, action three, right? And for any given policy, again, this is policy specific, right? For any given policy pi, I can fill in and store these values. So how do you store the value function for any policy? You can store it as a table. If the number of states is discrete and finite, and if the number of actions is discrete and finite, and the number of combinations of states and actions is small. <laughs> That's what we're actually going to assume, right? Now, we also say that, uh, which means that you're basically uh, storing, uh, when you're storing the state, you're basically averaging across all of these. So you're basically storing only one value for every uh, state, but then you can actually be explicitly stored to storing the state action value. So this table that I've got has actually got the table of state action values. That's going to be a larger table. You could store either of these. Now, let's go to another situation. Let's play chess. How many states in a game of chess? Right? How many of you play Go? There are no Go players in CMU. OK. Uh, so in a game of chess, there are about 10 raised to 120 states. That's a very large state space, right? How many actions? At any term, you can move one of 16 pieces, right? So that's 10 raised to 120 times 16. Even if I reduce it to 10, it's 10 raised to 120, you know, or 121, 122. It doesn't really matter. At that point, it's, the number is so large, you are not going to be storing a table, right? What about Go? Go has 10 raised to 160 possible states, which is why Go is considered much, much tougher than chess. So in that case, once again, regardless of the number of actions, even if it was only one action per state, you're not actually going to be storing the value function as a table. In that case, what would you do? Guess, what would you do? But then that's still, that's not going to let you solve your problems, right? So what would you do? If I gave you the problem, what would you do? Use your network to create the value. 
And what would the input of the neural network be? And the action, right? Yeah. Exactly. You're going to, a neural network is just a generic, it's one way of doing it, but you're going to compute a function, some function, where you can input the state, you can input the action, and it's going to give you a value. And that function must be learned and must be gener must generalize properly outside whatever you have trained it for, okay? So this business of storing the state, computing the state action value or the state value using a function, we won't deal with it till next week. Just wanted to introduce the idea. But then the point is that if I have n states and m actions, I'm going to have, a st have to store a table of n times n uh, state values, if I'm only storing state values, and n times m state action values, if I'm storing state action values, right? Now, the Bellman expectation equation, we've seen this. Suppose you're in any state, S. You take an action, you got a reward, right? Then at that state, you can go to one of several subsequent states after having taken the action. And so let's say this state has a, has a value V1, this state has a value V2, this state has a value V3, then the expected value over here is going to be the average over all of these three guys, right? So right here you're going to get summation probability of state, value of state. This is R S prime, S prime. So the probability of transitioning from the current state to S prime averaged over all of the S primes. This is the value that you're going to get at the next time. And of course you're going to discount it because it's at the next time and then you add this reward itself. So this guy, this R plus the average, discounted average of the next instant is the term that's within the parenthesis. That is the expected reward, expected return. But again, this is an MDP. Both the reward and the transitions are dependent on the action that you take. So the term in the parenthesis is the expected return if you, when you are in state S, if you take an action A, right? But because you have a probability distribution over actions, your policy can choose from one of many actions. They're going to average over all of the actions. And so the actual equation that you're get, going to get for the, uh, for the value function is the one on top. We've seen this before in the previous class, but this is just the standard Bellman expectation equation, right? I can write this Bellman expectation equation out as a matrix, matrix function. So if I, if I write all of the state values as one vector, then the term on the left is one vector. Now the rewards, the expected reward at every state across all actions is also just one value per state. So I can write those as a vector. And the expected transition matrices across all actions is also just one small transition matrix. I can write those as a matrix. And so the entire equation that I've got on top can be written in this manner over here. This is a nice little algebraic equation, V equals R plus gamma times P times V, right? So what is the size of this equation? The column vectors have as many terms as there are states. So if you have n states, it's going to be an equation, n equations and n unknowns. That matrix is n squared, n times n, and you'd have to solve for it, right? So I can write the whole thing. If I want to represent these, the vector as this, if I, if I represent the vector of state values using this term, the vector of expected rewards across all actions. Again, this is policy specific. Remember, this is always policy specific, right? because the probabilities of the different actions is going to be different for different policies. And the expected transition matrix across all actions is going to be different for different policies. So I can write this as V pi equals R pi plus gamma times P pi V pi, right? This is just a nice algebraic way of writing this big complex equation. And once I write it like so, it's very easy for you to figure out how to solve for the uh, solve for the state value, so prediction is easy. I can just write one minus gamma p inverse r pi. No problem, right? Everything's solved. Or is it? Now if you're playing chess, 
what is the size of that matrix that I'm trying to invert? It's 120 cross 10, 10 raised to 120 cross 10 raised to 120, right? And you're going to take the cube of that to invert it in terms of time. So that's going to be 10 raised to something absurd. Even the exponent is very large, right? So this is not going to be solvable directly. Same thing. Suppose I write the, the uh, equations that relate the state action values. Again, we've seen this Bellman expectation equation for state action values in the, in the last class. And if I write this out as a matrix equation, I'm going to have a column vector which has n times m entries, where n is the number of states, m is the number of actions. And so the matrix that I'm going to invert is n times m cross n times m. And that's going to be impossible to invert, okay? So now here is our problem, our very first problem. I start off with a Markov decision process. Everything is well defined. The state, I know exactly what the transition matrices are going to be under every action. I have chosen my policy, so I know the probability distribution over actions. There's no unknown, and yet, if you actually want to compute the action, and the equations are very simple, if you actually want to compute the action, the state value function or the state action value, it's not going to be feasible using any reasonable computer of today, right? So how do you solve this? Now for this, I'm going to take you back in time to when you were a little kid, third grade, or maybe fourth grade, okay? And when did you first learn about division in school? Which, which grade? Second grade, third grade, fourth grade? Okay, so we're gonna go back to the fourth grade. You're all little kids, okay? And I'm going to give you a tiny little problem. I'm going to ask you to solve this problem, AX equals B. I give you A, I give you B. I'm giving you some extra information. I'm telling you that A lies, or rather the, yeah, A lies between zero and two, just to make things simpler, right? You don't want very large A's. How would you solve for it, AX equals B? I've given you the answer on the slide, right? You're just going to write X equals B over A. That's this, this. you don't need to go back to, I mean, you can do that in the third grade. Now I'm going to add this, now I'm going to bridge your third grade self with your current self sitting here at CMU. You're going to solve that third grade equation using a computer. But then you have the strange situation, your CPU does not permit the act of division. How would you solve it? Anybody? Pardon me? Okay, if I solve AX minus B equals zero, how does that help me? It's a scalar. You're going to search? Search for the X. So you start from like the initial guess. And so you're going to scan from left to right. Yeah, that's a good guess. Can you come up with something a little more formal than that? Pardon me? Binary search. Binary search. Math, I'm not searching. Can somebody give me a... You're not allowed to search, right? It's going to take forever. And for some reason, your third grade teacher forgot to teach you how to divide. How are you going to solve it? I've given you a hint. It's on the board. Anybody? You, you girls at the back, how would you solve it? A, you're not allowed to divide. Your teacher forgot to teach you how to divide. Right? Okay. So, turns out it's a fun little problem. I'm going to write it like so. I'm going to say AX equals B, right? And 
Then from there, I will add a little, uh, how, how do I do this? Uh, I'm going to say x plus ax equals x plus b. This is correct. Nothing has changed, okay? So I can say x equals x minus ax plus b. Nothing's changed, right? And then, I'm going to write x equals 1 minus a x plus b. This is still correct? And so here's the beautiful answer. You start off with an estimate of x, some random value. And then I can just keep writing x k, the k plus 1 the estimate, equals 1 minus a times x k plus b. And if I keep going over this, this is guaranteed to give me the correct answer. Why would that be? You know this from somewhat in mid, from, from, in mid, from middle school, right? It's easy for you to see why this, is, why this has got to be the case. Let's work it out. It's I'm writing xk plus 1 equals 1 minus a xk plus b. So let's say I start off with x0, OK? What is x1? Equals 1 minus a x0 plus b, right? What is x2? 1 minus a x1 plus b. That's going to be, what is that? In terms of x0. What's it going to be in terms of x0? Ira. One minus a squared x zero. One minus a. One minus b a b. Plus b. Right? Is that correct? What about x three? What would it be in terms of x zero? Same thing, right? I multiply this by one, one minus a. It's going to be one minus a cubed x zero plus one minus a squared b plus one minus a b plus b, right? If I keep stepping through this, what is going to happen? I'm going to have xn or x k plus one equals one minus a raised to k plus one x zero plus b times one minus a raised to k plus one minus a raised to k minus one one. Correct? As I keep going on, this is an infinite series. I gave you a hint. I told you x a lies between 0 and 2. So what is this term going to become for very large k? What's it going to become? 0. What is the second term? It's a geometric series, right? b over 1 minus 1 minus a, which is b over a. Beautiful. Right? Fantastic. We just solved a division without performing division. So, uh, clear to you kids? The girls at the back? So, this is basically what we're going to do. We can start with any x0. That's the beauty of it. 
it doesn't matter how which x zero x zero you start with, the rate of convergence is pretty much the same because the first term becomes zero really fast, right? And so this and the, and the reason for this is the magnitude of one minus a was less than one, which is why you could use the summation of the geometric series. I'm going to use the same trick in the matrix domain. Okay, I'm going to say, consider any uh, vector equation, x equals ax plus b. That's basically the same thing as what I wrote over here, remember? That's basically the same thing here. Instead of a, I'm writing one minus a, but that's it, right? It's the same thing. So the moment I write this, then, so long as all the eigenvalues of a are less than one, remember we wanted one minus a to be less than one, right? Which is the equivalent of saying the eigenvalues of a are less than one. And I have some extra conditions which are not that big, not that big a deal, but so long as the eigenvalues of a are less than one, I can solve for this by using this simple iteration. And you, and you know why this works. We've already just seen that for the scalar case. Right? And questions? So we're going to use this, okay? We're going to use this like so. First, the very first thing is that for any Markov, for any stochastic matrix, for any Markov transition matrix, for any Markov chain, it's guaranteed that all the eigenvalues are less than one. Now, can, you, can anybody tell me why there's at least a one eigenvector with an eigenvalue of one for a, mark of, for a transition matrix? It's a trivial proof, right? What is the property of a transition matrix? Every row, what a, every row sums to one, right? Correct? So what would happen, what is the equivalent of, what is the action? If I write, write the act of summing every row, how can I write this in matrix form? Just multiply that matrix by a vector with all Exactly, correct. So for any transition matrix, I have A times one equals what is the output? One. So this is your standard eigenvalue equation, correct? And what is the corresponding, so this, this is an, your eigen decomposition, and what is the corresponding eigenvalue over here? The vector of ones is an eigenvector, right? And what is the corresponding eigenvalue? It's one. It's ax equals x, right? So you're guaranteed that a transition matrix does have at least one eigenvalue of one. And it's kind of a one-line proof, right? It's a slightly longer two-line proof or three-line proof to show that every eigenvalue is either going to be one or less than one for a Markov transition matrix, okay? I won't go into the proof for the second statement. I'll leave that to you to figure out or maybe put it in the quiz. Uh, but what this means is that if I go back to my value equation, so we're going, we've done this really fast zoom from you know third grade to back to grad school, right? Uh, if I go back to my value equation, I say v pi equals r pi plus gamma times p pi times v pi, right? P pi is a, p of pi is a transition matrix you're guaranteed that the eigenvalues are one or lesser, right? This means I can actually go back and use the series, series that I, uh, series expansion that I just showed you. And, and uh, I can just use this simple iteration and regardless of where you start from, it's going to converge to the correct solution for the state values. And what's the beauty of this process? There's no matrix inversion, right? 
You have solved this even for a state, you know, very large state transition matrix using this with hard, uh, with hard matrix inversion. But then you saw that, you know, you saw in the arithmetic case that for this to work, you have to go through the entire series. The series has to converge, right? Otherwise, the summation you get is going to be an approximation. Well, are we, do we really need to go through the infinite series? It turns out not, right? Eventually, at some point, the difference between one, one iteration and the next is going to be so small that you don't really care. And so you can just use this trivial iteration to solve the entire process. Right? Questions, anybody? So the beauty of this is it's all so simple, right? When I talk to you about Markov decision processes and spiders that jump and fly, flies that move, the whole thing seems kind of intractable and hard to model. But when you actually begin putting pen on paper and figure thinking about how the, how the whole thing works out, it actually turns out to be very simple. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's very pretty and fairly uh, uh, tractable arithmetic. So the actual implementation, if I were to implement it, how would I implement it? Very simple. I'm going to start off by assigning a value for all the states. And then once I assign a value for all the states, for every state, you, we saw that update rule, correct? For every state, I would go through the states and I would compute the update the value for that state using all of the other states and then move on to the next state. And I can do it in one of two ways. I can do, do this in batch mode, where I assign a current value for all the states, use these, and then update all the states all at once. Or I can perform in-place computation, where I go through the states, and for each state, I update the state value, and use the updated state value when I update the next state. Either of these is perfectly acceptable, but all of them are guaranteed to converge. And uh, the, the, the thing is still pretty much guaranteed to work. Now, the thing is, if you were actually doing this for a real system, like a real chess game, then you're not going to bother updating those states who we don't really care very much about, right? And uh, so uh, you, you could, you'd be sampling which states you're going to update according to some realistic model for the world. And maybe you won't actually converge to the optimal solution for all the states, but you'll still come up with some reasonable guess. So I'm going to do this for a little example. This is from uh, Sutton, Sutton and Bartos textbook. Uh, they, they call this the grid world. And the grid world is of this kind. It has a bunch of boxes. It's just a four cross four square. And the two corner squares are shaded gray. So anytime you arrive in any square, if you arrive in the shaded gray square, you get no reward. You can rest. But if you arrive at one of the other squares, you get a little electric shock each time, right? And uh, there's no, the uh, state, the environment doesn't really change. So all you're left with in this particular trivial, uh, trivial problem is actions and you can choose between, so there's no transi the transition matrix per se, the transition is your action in this case. And you can choose one of four actions. You can move, to move a step left, you can move a step right, you can move a step down, you can move a step up. And your policy is to take any one of these four actions with equal probability, okay? So if you do that, then, and of course, if you go up and you hit a wall, you're going to come back into the same state. So there's no transitioning out of the box, okay? So if you do that, what is the, uh, uh, how do we actually update? Use the Bellman optimality, uh, Bellman expectation equations. How do you solve for this using the little iteration that we just saw, right? Here's how I do it. Ignore the boxes to the right. The boxes to, we'll get back to the boxes to the right later. But just let, let's look at the uh, boxes on the left. And in fact, for the moment, ignore those as well. Let's just actually try doing this on the So I have Okay, 
every box that's not shaded has a reward of minus one. We get an electric shock, right? So initially, I'm going to initialize all of these by saying all of these have value zero. It really isn't zero, we know that, but this is our initial guess, okay? Now, let's go back and use our, and our four actions are, you can go in any four directions, any other four directions with equal probability, okay? So let's say you want to update this box. What is your next guess for the value of that box going to be? How did we actually come up with this? So the new value for a box, is going to be the reward for that box plus gamma times average of, you know, neighboring. There's no self-transition. You're not going back to the same box in this particular setup, right? So this is what the, uh, this is what the, the uh, Bellman, the, 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 the iteration, iterative formula told us, right? This is actually the Bellman expectation equation. So let's use this guy. Using this one, what is the new value for this box? What is the reward for being in that box? You girls at the back, what is the reward for being in that box? The way we defined it, only the two shaded boxes have a reward of zero. Everything else, if you land in the box, you get an electric shock, it's minus one. So what is the reward of being in the box? Minus one, right? What is the average reward, average value of the adjacent states according to our current estimate? The value of the adjacent states? Zero, all the neighbors are zero, right? And the current one is minus one. So this guy is minus one. This guy is zero. Right? Did I lose you? Yeah. Pardon me? You're good with that, right? So let me say this guy is minus one, therefore. Yeah? What about this corner? What's it going to be? You know what's it going to be? Minus one, right? What about every box? Every box is going to be minus one because the adjacent values are all zero. Their average is zero, but there's a local reward of minus one, correct? Except the two corner boxes where the, the reward was also zero. So let's go ahead and update it. But then now I want to go back and redo my estimate, okay? What is the updated value for this box going to be? Use the same formula. What is the reward of being in that box? Minus one. What is the average of the neighbors? Minus one. So what is the new value you're gonna put in the box? Minus minus one plus minus one, right? Our discount was one, so this is gonna be minus two. What about this guy? What about this guy? That's also going to be minus two, correct? Even though it's a corner. There's a current of our reward plus the average of the neighbors, so it's gonna be minus two. What about this box? What's it going to be? What's the reward of being in that box? What's the reward of being in that box? What is the average of the neighbors? Is the average minus one for that box? I'm looking at, you have to be looking at me when I point at things. This one. One half? No. How many, how many neighbors do I have? Three. 
3 divided by? Because it's minus 1, and the average of the neighbors is 2 over 3, minus 2 over 3, correct? Because two of them have minus 1, the third is 0, right? So what is minus 2, 1 point, minus 1 point, minus 0 0.677, right? 666, 666, 666. So now this guy is going to become 1.66. This guy is going to become 1.66. This is going to become 1.66. This is going to become 1.66. All the rest of them are going to become minus 2. You see how that happened? Right? What about the next iteration now? So now this, at iteration 2, this is what I've got. Yeah? Now at the next iteration, what is the new value for this box? Minus 3, because the reward is minus 1, but the neighbors average to minus 2. So this became minus 3. What about this guy? It's going to remain the same because the neighbors were 0, 2, and 2, correct? And the current reward is minus 1. So it's going to remain, remain minus 1.66. Make sense? You're looking puzzled. No, OK. So this guy remained 1.66. But now what about this one? What happens to this one? What is the reward updated value for this one here? It's my average of minus 1.6 is 66 minus 2 and minus 2 plus minus 1. Right? So this is going to be something lesser than 2, minus 2. So see what is happening. At each iteration, that 0 in the corners is kind of leaking out into the sides. Right? In the first iteration, all of them were 0. But then because we anchored these two guys to have 0 reward, right? their rewards are sort of leaking out. And so the next iteration, you're going to have that. And so as you, as you keep moving down, eventually, after infinite iterations, you're going to find that the two corner boxes are 0, because you're not allowed to change their value. Those are game over, game over corners. That's where the game ends. You catch the fly. But their value sort of leaks out. And so the guys which are the farthest from those two corners, they end up with an award reward of minus 22, minus 20, minus 14, minus 18. You see how it goes, right? And if you, beyond this point, if you keep iterating, it's not going to increase. Any, it's not going to change any further. OK? So you can see exactly what's happening. As you keep iterating through the boxes, the things that are anchored transmit their information outwards slowly to fill up all of the boxes. And this is going to be the final values for all of the boxes. These are going to be the final values for all of the boxes. Make sense to everyone? Right? We saw how the whole thing sort of moved out. So this is the simple value iteration that uh, you're going to uh, that we'll be performing. Okay? So again, we kept in each case we kept the same policy. I asked you to ignore the boxes to the right. In each case, we kept the same policy. That from any place you could be traveling to any of the neighbors with equal probability. Right? That was the policy that we actually retained. But then that's, so that just tells you how to compute the value for one policy. How do you compute the optimal policy? So to compute the optimal policy, this is the business of control. For this, let me go back and let me revisit the grid world. Okay. So this is exactly the same problem as before, and we know how to solve this problem. right? And this figure shows you from top to bottom how the whole process transited. Using, using the policy of you know, equally likely transitions in any direction, correct? But then now let's go and look at the figure to the right. If you look at the, if you use the k equals 0 policy values, if those were the true values, right? And then if you were in any particular box, which is the best policy? The best policy is the one that gives you the highest reward in the next iteration, right? Or in the next step. So over here, for example, what is the best policy? If you're over here, do you want to go here or here or here? Where would you want to go? You want to go down, because that's where you get the least penalty, right? 
the least expected penalty in the long term. Well, we're here, where do you want to go? You want to go down, right? So there's a policy, there's a better policy than the random policy even in this box, correct? And so now look at what happens over there. To the top left, if you, see, if you look at the initial estimates for the values, all of the boxes are equally good, so the best policy is really the random policy. But after even one iteration, if you look at the values, again, these are the values computed using the random policy. But using those values, if you look at what is the better thing to do than something, than say being random, then you observe that the policies you get are the ones to the right, right? That if you're near the corners, the best thing to do is to go to the corners, not to any other places. In the other places, you don't really care. After two iterations, the policy becomes even more definitive, right? And if you're near the corners, you want to go to the corner. Basically, at each point, you're heading towards the corners, correct? You see what's happening? The best policy. And after three iterations, it becomes even more concrete. Based on these values, now you have a much stronger idea of what is the correct thing to be doing to get the best reward at each state, right? Now here's the funny thing. The values themselves I have been continuously computing using just the random policy. But based on those, I can come up with a better policy, right? And the more interesting thing is the optimal policy that you get, the policy that you get you find the optimal policy way before you find the actual value of the states. After the third iteration, the policy that you come up with is already the same as the policy you would have after infinite iterations. See what I mean? Right? So now we can let me uh, so look at this. So the business of finding the optimal policy is here's how we are going to use this. That, that gives us an idea of how we can actually find the optimal policy. We started with a random policy. We found the values for the states using the random policy. But then you looked at those values, and then you came up with a better policy. In this case, you can't, right? So we're going to use the same procedure. If you're going to start to find the optimal policy, you're going to start off with a random policy. We're going to assign random values to the states. You're going to start off with some random policy. And then based on the random policy, you're going to compute. You're going to go through these iterations till they converge. And you're going to compute the optimal values for every state. Uh, we're going to compute the values for every state. And then once you've computed the values for every state, you're going to look at those values and decide on a better policy, which tells you for each state what is the best thing to be doing. Okay. Now that you, in the example that we just saw in the, grid, saw in the grid world, that immediately gives you the optimal policy. In real life, that won't. Once you update your policy, your, the better thing to do is to go back and re-estimate the values for all of the states, and then use those updated values, and then update your policy again. So the right thing to be doing is something like this. We want to, uh, let me, uh, actually just do this, right? So we're going to start with any random policy. Then until the whole thing converges, for the current policy, you're going to run the entire iteration till you find the values for all the states. And then once you've found the values for all the states, you're going to update the policy by saying, at each state, go in the, take the action that maximizes this guy, which is the current reward plus the average reward of all of the neighbors, or the average reward of the neighbors that you would arrive at with the new action, right? The new action is going to be going to possibly take you to only one neighbor. See what I'm, you see what I'm talking about, right? The figure sort of explains it very cleanly. So uh, this, is the, the, this is the nice compact way of talking about how you uh, now observe that the policy that I'm suggesting at each iteration is to take the action that maximizes the, maximizes the expected value at the next step, right? So it's greedy. You're not saying, you know, maximize the, you know, give that high probability or anything of that kind. Always take the one action 
that maximizes the value for the next step, right? So this is a greedy algorithm. And so I'm going to, I can just sort of compact this and simply write this as greedy. And this is what we call the policy iteration. Now observe that although we are doing spending a lot of time computing values, the name I've given it is the policy iteration. Why? Because the final objective is to get a policy. Right? I'm going to compute, I'm going to start off with an initial policy, iterate, compute my values, and then once I've computed the values, I'm going to go off and find a greedy policy that opt and then use the new policy, go back and compute my values, go back and compute my greedy policy, and so on. Right? So this is my policy iteration. The end goal is to find a policy. Now, so this is uh, the overall policy iteration. And this will probably converge to the optimal policy. Why? Because we saw in the last class that for every Markov decision process, there is an optimal policy, or there may be a set of optimal policies, right? And all the optimal policies are strictly equivalent. We've already seen this in the last class. Now, the way we've defined this, the values that you get for every state, the new policy is going to increase that value, right? And at each step, you're continuously increasing the values of the states because you're always picking a greedy policy. And if you're always increasing the value for every state, then it's, where is it eventually going to converge? It's going to converge at one of the optimal policies. So this is guaranteed to find you an optimal policy. It may not do so, but do so very quickly, but it's guaranteed to give you an optimal policy, okay? So it may take several iterations. Now, I can replace this by something called the generalized policy iteration. So this was what we call the policy iteration. You start off with a policy, you update the policy, you update the policy, you update the policy, and so you're iterating over policies. The reason, only reason you're computing values in the middle is in our, so that you can use the values to go back and compute a new policy, right? But you're always computing values based on a policy, and then you keep updating the policies. So it's called the policy iteration. And here is the really pretty thing. You don't need to use the specific iteration that we just saw to compute the values of the states. You can use any odd algorithm to compute the values of the states. You don't really care, right? So long as you get the values of the states, you're fine. So you could be using any algorithm to come up with an, to, to guess the values of the states, given the current policy. And then once you have the values, I can use any odd algorithm to decide the next policy. It doesn't have to be the greedy one. The only thing that is required is that the new policy must have, must be such that under the new policy, I must have some guarantee that the values will be greater than what I get for every state are gonna be greater than the values I had under the previous policy and it's going to keep increasing the values. So this is just the uh, generalization, basically. You can say, you can start with any value and pick any policy that is guaranteed to improve the value, use that value and use that policy and use any mechanism to compute the values. And so long as you keep looping over this, so long as you keep looping over this, right, you can see the mouse, right? So I can start with any value. I can use any mechanism to choose a better policy, use that policy, choose any mechanism to compute the value, and so long as I keep looping, I'm eventually guaranteed to find the best policy. So, and here is a really pretty thing about this whole mechanism, which is that all states will hit their optimal value together. That's which means that when you actually find the optimal value for one state, you can be sure that you also found the optimal values for all of the other states. That's an optimal value, value theorem. I'm not going to prove it, but it's uh, fairly easy to show, okay? So, and this means a policy has an optimal value in any state if and only if for every other state reachable from that state, the value is also optimal. The two statements are making this, clear. both of these statements are basically saying the same thing. As you keep going through the policy iterations, 
you're going to find a policy based on it you find values based on those values you find a policy based on those values you find a you know poor policy you find values you keep going through this right yeah so for the policy iteration you start from, you start with a random policy and you update it you start with a random policy compute values you update the optimal policy no so you start with a policy you compute the values based on those values you update your policy No, no. So you can start with any policy. So here, basically, here's what we would do, right? So if you go back to the grid world, you started with a random policy, right? You started with a random policy, and then you ended up with these values. But then when I look at this, I know that over here, instead of traveling randomly, if I always went to this guy every time, this one's value is going to be better than minus 2. Correct? So now I change my policy in a manner that is guaranteed to improve the value of every state, right? And this means I have a new policy under which the values are going to be better. So I'm going to fix that new policy and then go back and update all of my state values and keep repeating the process. Make sense, right? And this is guaranteed. And eventually, when it, the whole thing converges, you're going to find the optimal policy value for all of the uh, states all at once. So this is what we call the uh, the uh, optimal uh, uh, the policy iteration. Okay. Now here's something that happened. So we figured out the policy iteration, right? But in the policy iteration, there's this peculiar argument that we are making, or that I need that uh, the requirement that we have, that as soon as you pick a policy, you run several iterations of that funky you know optimization algorithm for funky iteration algorithm such that you find the values for all of the states under that policy correct and then having found those values you went back and updated the policy that's that's what this particular algorithm is requiring you to do but is it really necessary for you to go and compute the values to run this value iteration all the way to till convergence not really, because if you go back and look at the grid, the grid world, you didn't have to go for infinite steps. If all you're interested is in updating the policy, then after four iterations, you already had hit the optimal policy. All the rest of your equations, your iterations were unnecessary, correct? So this means there's no need for you to run this value iteration all the way to, I mean, the, the uh, Bellman iterations all the way till convergence. You could have stopped at any point and then updated your policy, right? So basically the greedy policy here converges to the optimal long before the value function converges, right? So we're going to change this guy and say, we observe that in the grid world, we didn't really need this to run to convergence. The optimal policy was found long before the actual value function converged even in the you know even in the uh, uh, first upper iteration so this means that you don't really need the prediction iterations to converge right prediction is what you is is this business of trying to find the value for every state correct so you don't really need that to converge we can do a shortcut we can just say i'm going to run l it l iterations of the l updates in the prediction equation some number l and then having run the L updates, I can go back and I can go back and compute the, the update my policy, right? L doesn't even have to be a large number. In fact, I can do this. I take a policy, I'm going to run one update of the prediction equation. Right? Then using just this, just this somewhat improved estimate of the values, I can go and immediately update my policy. And then as soon as I've immediately updated my policy, I can run one iteration of the, uh, you know, estimate, the prediction estimator to update the values for all of my states. Then from that, I can go back and immediately update my policy and keep repeating this process, right? And so, uh, and at each point, I'm just going to use the greedy policy, right? Now let me write that write that down in equations. 
So here's what the real procedure we are suggesting is. Start off with any policy pi zero, then use one iteration of the prediction dynamic program to find the value functions for all of the states. And then, and that iteration is going to be just this guy over here, right? There's a formula. And then from the updated values, you go back and find the greedy, improve your policy. You, you can just use the greedy, uh, 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 the, the greedy solution. Basically at each step, at each state, pick the action that maximizes the expected return at the next step, right? And so, well, this is really a bit of a bug. This is not exactly how you do it. You can't start with a random policy. What you would really do is to change the order in which you're computing things. So here's what I will really do. I'm going to initially assign some random values to all of my states, okay, randomly. Once I've assigned random values to all of my states, I can, from these random values, I can l randomly learn a policy for every state. And the policy I'm going to learn for every state is to choose the action that maximizes the value for that state, right? But then now I have an updated policy. I have a policy. From that policy, I'm going to go back and update the values for all of the states using one iteration of the dynamic program, okay? And then having done one iteration, having updated the values, I can go back and now I can compute the, update the policy for every state, right? Now observe something over here. I can collapse these two equations. I can collapse these two steps. How would I collapse these two steps? Anyone? I don't need to explicitly compute a policy, do I? Look at what is happening over here. First, I compute the value, right? Then, from based on the values, I'm picking the action which maximizes this term, right? Which maximizes this term. That's my greedy algorithm, correct? So, and then I'm going to update the value. I can actually just collapse the two to do this. Can I not? You see how they are the same thing? So look what happened over here. In each step, I computed a value. Then from these values, I picked the action which maximized this guy. And for that action, so my policy is going to be one for the, the P of pi is going to be one for the best action and zero for the rest, right? So instead of saying average over pi, I can just take a max because I'm always choosing the action for which that term is maximized. There's no need for an intermediate step of explicitly computing the policy. I can just say pick the maximum of the neighbor, neighbors and shove it in, right? And so that gives me this updated formula, right? And so here is this beautiful uh, outcome that we started off by saying that I can update the value at each time. I can just run one update of the values and based on the one update of the values, I can update my policies. And based on the updated policy, I can run one update of the values. When I collapse the whole thing, I ended up with an, I ended up with an iteration that never actually computes a policy. It just keeps updating the values for my states continuously at each time, right? And this is guaranteed to, so observe that there's no fixed policy at this point, that subscript pi doesn't even make any sense anymore, right? You're just, you're doing this whole thing without referring to a policy, without actually ref referring to a policy. Yeah, and so now basically I'm going to set all of my values and at each iteration I'm going to keep updating my state values and, uh, and this is the entire, so I got rid of the pi, I'm just calling it V star and if I run this iteration to convergence, 
I'm guaranteed that at the end, the values I get for all of the states are going to be the values under an optimal policy. Right? Make sense to everybody? I mean, it's very intuitive. The whole thing sort of, the math looks a little complex, but when you actually work here, see the logical progression. It's very straightforward. What do you think this iteration would be called? Since you never compute a policy, it's a value iteration. You're continuously just updating the values, right? This is called the value iteration. Observe that there's no explicit policy estimation. You're directly learning the optimal uh, values. And while you're iterating, the intermediate values that you get at any time may be completely meaningless. They, might, they may not refer to any given policy. The problem with this particular procedure is that the outcomes, the V stars that you compute, only make sense after the whole thing converges. Right? So let's, this is the value iteration again. It's each state simply, if I just want to say this in words, all that happens is that each state inherits the cost of its best neighbor. That's it, right? It looks, a, it, it looks like a complicated little equation, but then when you think about it in terms of you know, what is really happening in arithmetically, each state is just inheriting the value of its best neighbor. So to see how this actually works, let's go back and look at the grid world uh, again. So this is the value iteration example. So I'm going to start with, don't even look at the figure. Let's go right back over here, right? And see how this works. So These two guys are fixed, they're not allowed to change, right? In that case, so it's not even that figure. I'm going to give you a different example over here, right? Let's not even think about that figure, okay? So I'm going to initialize all of these values as zero. And the iteration I'm going to use is that each state is going to pick as its new updated value, the reward for that state. So what we are doing is max over A, RSA plus gamma summation, you know, PASS prime. Well, the space is too, too, too uh, small to write it. But if I want to write it simply, it's going to be the reward at that state for the action. In our case, in our grid world, grid world example, the reward is not dependent on the action, right? Plus the max, our gamma is, our gamma is one. We are not using a discount factor. Plus the maximum of the neighbors. That's a simple rule that we're going to use for every one of the boxes, okay? So, what is this one's updated value now? Anyone? What would it be? Pardon me? Negative one. Why? Hmm. Why? The reward is minus one, and the best of its neighbors is zero. Minus one, right? So let's say I'm doing this sequentially. I'm not doing this in batch mode. So the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to go like this and all the way to this one, right? What is the value for this one now? Minus one, because it's still taking the best of its neighbors, right? This one, still gonna be minus one. If you actually work it out, because the bests are all zero, it's going to be So this didn't, this was fine, okay? Now next iteration, I start from here again. What is the value for this guy? 
minus two. Current reward plus the best of its neighbors, right? This one. Still minus two, right? This one. Minus one, because the best of its neighbors is zero. This doesn't change, this is minus one. This is minus two, minus two, minus two, minus one, minus two. Minus two, minus two, minus two, minus two, minus one, and zero, right? Now, next iteration, what is the best value for this guy? Minus three. For this one, it's going to stay minus two, minus one, right? In just three steps, the thing has already told you what must do, right? It's, it's enough for you to have gotten a value where you already know the, the policy, optimal policy, right? It's going to be minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, and, uh, and the whole thing is mirrored. So you see how the whole thing works. The policy iteration actually works, right? The value iteration actually works. Now, the, so we actually saw a version where the updates were, as, were asynchronous. They were not doing, we were not doing batch updates across all the states. You could do this either in batch or asynchronous. It doesn't really matter, right? Uh, the uh, uh, thing is, So what have we done so far? We have learned about prediction. What is prediction? Again, what is prediction? What is prediction? Yeah, the back. No, so the, for, for, we had a term, right? We said prediction and control. There were two stages. So what was prediction again? Prediction was given a policy, you were finding the values for all the states. So the, so the, uh, so the uh, iteration we saw, the dynamic progr programming iteration we saw early on, that was the prediction iterations. We are given a policy, we went through the whole process and found the values for all the states, right? What was control? Control was the business of finding the optimal policy. So prediction, given an MDP with a policy, you find the values for all the states. Control is find me the optimal policy, right? And we just saw how you can actually estimate. We saw that prediction can be done using a closed form formula, but it's gonna to be too expensive. And we saw an iterative process for computing, performing the prediction, where if you keep updating the steps, the values iteratively, eventually you're going to get the actual values for all the states. We learned about policy iteration. Policy iteration where you are alternating prediction and policy estimation. So you started with a policy, you run these prediction iterations to compute the values for all the states, and then given the values, you computed the new policy. Then you stopped with the policy, went back and computed the prediction iteration for all the states, computed all of the values, re-estimated re the policy, and so on. So this was the policy iteration. Then we also saw the value iteration. The value iteration was, what was the value iteration again? You just, you just keep updating the values and you're guaranteed that if you use this specific rule for updating the values, which is to say at each time you just pick the best of its neighbors, right? And take the action that takes you to the best of your, your best neighbor. That is, and uh, that, you compute the value that you would have if you went to your best neighbor, right? That iteration is guaranteed eventually to give you the optimal values for all the states. And once you have the optimal values from those, of course, you can go back and actually compute your policy, right? Uh, now, there's an alternate strategy. You could, instead of looking at choosing the optimal, uh, 
you know, we looked at value functions. Everything that we did was in terms of value functions. You could do the same thing with action value functions. Nothing really changes, right? The, uh, the uh, action value functions don't really change. The, uh, and, but your policy keeps changing. So you can write all of these arithmetic in terms of action value functions. The reason I didn't actually write it out is that how many action value terms do we have? If you have n states and m actions, you have n times m values, right? Whereas if you have n states, you only have n times m action values. Whereas you only have n values. So it's kind of easier to describe in terms of values. But then why would you want to worry about this whole action value business if it's just blowing up the space of, you know, the set of numbers without really buying you anything new. It turns out, turns out that when you go into real world problems, you want to talk about action values and not values. Because the number of actions could be infinite. And so you want, for example, if you're driving a car, right, you need to know uh, to be able to pick amongst all the possible actions is going to be really hard, right? So you like to define talk in terms of, in the real world, you always talk about action values. And you'll see that in the next class. So what we've done so far is to work with planning. Someone gave us a Markov decision process. Based on that complete definition of the Markov decision process, we came up with the optimal policy. We figured out how to write the values for the states. We came up with the optimal policy. Now, three classes ago, I lied to you. I said, we're going to have a series of lectures on reinforcement learning. We've had three lectures, and I haven't touched upon reinforcement learning. What we've talked about is Markov decision processes and the task of planning. In the next lecture, we'll talk about reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is what happens when the Markov decision process is unknown, right? You see how if you know the MDP, the whole process is very simple, right? The arithmetic is very trivial. There's nothing co particularly complicated about it. You could go back, you could look at my slides, and everything will make sense. You don't have to work very hard to think about it because we never went past you know, 12th grade arithmetic at any point. There were no fancy integrals. There were no, I mean, you always knew how to pick, up the, pick the largest object in a collection. You always knew how to add a few numbers and multiply, you know, take expectations. And that's all we really did. Three classes of doing high school math, right? Now, in the next class, we're going to do even less math. We're going to see how in the real world you can do all of this without even knowing the underlying Markov decision process. Questions? None? Thank you.